been my wrestler for a while. <laughs> Well, it's, I just praise God for being back with you once again. Amen. <laughs> it is Amen. always good to be here, and I'm so glad that um, the pastor, you know, that, uh, that Ivy was so willing to have me come to, to uh, minister to you today, because this topic is really on my heart, been my heart for years, and so it's just a blessing to be able to share with others. I'm just going to sing um, a little bit of a song. And then I'm going to go right into the message, okay? Right. Sound good? Sure. Sounds good to me. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through pride their pain, living fear to fear, laughter hides their silent cries, only Jesus hears, people need the Lord, people need the Lord, at the end of road. Easy open doors. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? We are called to take his life to a world where wrong seems right who could be too great a cause for sharing life with one who's lost through his love our hearts can feel all the grief they bear they must hear the words of life only we can share. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, easy open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that we must give our lives for people need the Now the message is remembering the persecuted church. What comes to your mind when you hear the word persecution? Anybody? What comes to your mind? Injustice. Attack. Attack. Okay, good. Somebody and grabbing a woman's purse and then she fights and protect her. So. Hate and injustice. Okay, good answer so far. Yes. Well, anyway, persecution comes from the basic word persecute which means to harass in a manner designed to injure, grieve, or afflict, as you all have expressed in your answers, to cause to suffer because of belief. And we know that throughout history of Christianity, Christians have been the main target of persecution. Now, before his conversion, Paul initially opposed the followers of Jesus and sought to end the spread of the gospel. He thought he was doing something right. Now, he's first mentioned in the New Testament as being present at the stoning of Stephen, who was declared a Christian martyr. And I'm just going to start off with the first uh, a few verses in Acts, just the first four verses, and it will go from there. But in any way, it shows how Saul approved of Stephen being stoned to death. Now, his name was Saul, 
before he became Paul. So that's why I'm referring to him as Saul, because that was right before his conversion. But anyway, if we go on, if we go to Acts uh, 1 through 4, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So you see that at this time, Saul at that time was okay with the death of Stephen, who was declared the first murder. Now Saul had extreme hostility to the growing believers and the spread of the gospel message, even if it meant putting the followers of Jesus to death. So Saul's rejection of Jesus as a Messiah led him to believe that he needed to persecute the followers of Jesus. But anyway, going from house to house, Saul at that time, he dragged off both men and women and put them to prison. But fortunately, God had other plans for Saul. He was on his way to imprison and persecute these Christians when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. And this is what changed his heart and life. Saul, whose name was eventually changed to Paul, had a dramatic conversion. And now he wanted to fulfill God's plan to build up the church and spread the gospel of salvation. So he had a 180 degree change of heart. So persecution against Christians happened many years ago, and we know what's still happening today. For many years, what country do you think was number one on the list where the harshest persecution of Christians occurred? Saudi Arabia. Uh, okay, anybody else? Someone said Saudi Arabia. Jerusalem. Anybody else want to give an answer? The Middle East. The Middle East is another, okay, anybody else? America? I don't know. You say America? Yeah. Not America. Not the number one. Oh. There's persecution here, but not number one country. Now, North Korea for 20 years was the number one oh. persecution of never Christians. Guessed. And Afghanistan wasn't far behind it. Now, to tell you a little bit about Afghanistan, Joe's, Joe Biden's chaotic uh, withdrawal of U.S. military personnel from Afghanistan in August of 2021 plunged the country into disarray, as you all know, and it put a death sentence on Christian in a harsher way than it had been in years. And since the Taliban became the ruling party of the country, the beatings, the kidnapping, the torture and murder of Christians and other minority groups increased dramatically. And three of the, um, now North Korea, I will talk about that uh, country too a little bit, but three of the worst persecutors of Christians are Muslims, Hindus, and Communists. Now, fortunately, there are organizations that provide support for persecuted Christians, such as Open Doors is one organization, the International Christian Concern is another organization that provides support to persecuted Christians can their families of martyrs, and Voice of the Martyrs. Now, Richard and Sabrina Wormbrand founded Voice of the Martyr after being imprisoned for their Christian witness in communist Russia. Richard used to be an atheist, but after he received Jesus as his Savior and Lord, he became a gifted evangelist and he shared the gospel message to everybody who was willing to listen. And he was, he was fearless. He was not afraid of persecution at all. But anyway, Tortured for Christ, which I have a, a book here, and I'm gonna give it as a free book to anybody who wants it. But anyway, that book was birthed out of the experience that Richard Wormbrand had. Now Richard and his wife, performed missionary work among the Romanians, and many people were led to the Lord Jesus. 
And because Christians worship Jesus and they don't reverence or revere the communist system of government, they were the Christians were considered a threat. And still they're considered a threat. But most communists are atheists. They're deceived because they think that there is no God. And if there is no God, then there's no punishment for evil. So this is their mindset. This is how they were thinking. And communists who persecute Christians get absolute joy out of watching Christians suffer. Three examples that I'm going to mention in this book here, Tortured for Christ. And one example of what the Christians had to go through, at least, at least what Richard went through, handcuffs would be placed on the Christian with sharp nails on the inside near their wrists. And if the person was totally still, the nails wouldn't cut them if they were still, but in bitterly cold cells, and oftentimes they would put Christians in very cold cells. And of course, when you begin to get cold, your body automatically shakes a little bit. But when, when the Christians shook with cold, then their wrists would be torn by these nails. That was one form of persecution. Now, some Christians were pet placed in ice box refrigerator cells, so cold that frost formed. Now, Richard experienced this torture by being placed inside of this cell with very little clothing on. Prison doctors would watch through an opening until they saw signs of freezing to death. And then the doctors would tell the guards to warm up the Christians so that they wouldn't die. And then after these, the, the Christian was warmed up a bit, they immediately did the same thing back again in these icebox cells to freeze again. And this was something that happened over and over again. I don't know how many times Richard endured this or how many times other Christians endured this, but he said, I'm going to hold fast to the Lord no matter what. So you know it's very difficult when the body goes through any kind of um, uh, persecution like that because it you know the, it goes against our, our flesh thing. But anyway, some Christians were placed in wooden boxes without much room to move, and dozens of sharp nails were driven into every side of the box with razor sharp points that were sticking through the wood. And if the person stood still, no harm was done. But when a person was forced to stand for hours, the body's going to become fatigued. And of course, when you're tired, you begin to sweat. Your body moves. And then when the person became tired, the nails would pierce their bodies as another form of persecution. And one other was sleep deprivation. You know, the body needs to sleep. And when the body's deprived of sleep, it affects a person terribly. But anyway, the Christian would be placed in a cell. And through a hole, hungry rats, hungry rats would come in to attack. And under such circumstances, how could anyone sleep? It's very difficult because this, the rats are biting. You're trying to shoot the rats away. And these were just a few of the many stories, but there are many more. I don't want to get into them because you'll be able to read about them in this particular book. But by 1956, Richard had been in prison for eight and a half years. And during that time, he lost a lot of weight. He had ugly scars from the beatings and was even placed in solitary confinement. That means he's all by himself in a cell and he had to keep himself encouraged in the Lord day after day, day after day, thinking about the Lord. And the Lord, for some miraculous way, got him through this. So seeing that Richard wouldn't break, even after all of that, they finally released Richard. But after his release, he preached two more sermons. And when the, the authorities found out, they imprisoned him for five and a half more years, making it 14 years altogether, many of those years in solitary confinement. But he didn't give up. And again, that was a birth of Voice of the Martyrs. Now, many, many believers died due to the harsh conditions in a communist prison. And after being released, Richard and his wife founded again Voice of the Martyrs, which is a missionary organization that serves persecuted Christians in the world's most difficult and dangerous places to be a Christian. So the cost to follow Jesus is very high in many parts of the world. 
But these Christians consider it through all that they go through. They consider it an honor to suffer for the cause of Christ. And as you can see, I have a, a, a map here, and you'll find out the harshest uh, places of the world where there's persecution, and hopefully each person will have a chance to look at that map, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But due to the limited amount of time that I have, there are many countries to cover, but I'm only going to be able to narrow it down to a few more, and that is China, where churches will be, will, will be uh, torn down, crosses were torn down, and uh, North Korea, Nigeria, and Iran. Now, China is notorious for destroying church buildings, and they, it would just raise the church completely down. A, a pastor could have a church in a big congregation, and he could wake up the next morning, and the church is down to the ground because the government tore it down because they are against anything about Christianity. Now, this is especially true if churches are not registered with a communist government. Now, when underground churches, now underground churches are not registered with the communist government because they want to follow God's word, they want to follow God's leading, and they don't want the government interfering with what they're preaching to the people. Now, a lot of the underground churches are not as visible where groups of people may worship in homes. And when, home, when these homes are discovered, sometimes what would happen, the government would try to shut down the um, these underground churches as well. So the believers have to be very, very careful and try to use skill and wisdom and understanding when they worship. Now one can understand why pastors don't want an atheist government overseeing what takes place. But Beijing has even cracked down on online Christian activities. And if they find out that believers are trying to order books online, they'll shut that down. But anyway, Oftentimes, men, uh, pastors and even members of the church have been sent to prison simply because they love the Lord Jesus and they are preaching the gospel or they have literature in their home. Now, one thing that's unfortunate, it's illegal for anybody to go to church or have any type of Christian education until the age of 18. Well, you know, the reason it's so sad because many... Um, Families have been pressured, and when they enrolled their children in, in communist doctrines to be brainwashed up to the age of 18, imagine how much brainwashing can go on. So it's got to be strong families who are determined to raise their children so they don't go along with a communist system. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about North Korea. Kim Jong-un is a dictator. Now, a dictator has absolute authority. That is not God's way. Because oftentimes when a person is a dictator and what, what that one person says is law, it's very, very dangerous for a, a whole country. But anyway, North Korea, this dictator, demands that people worship him and his family. Can you imagine? This is, what, this is his mindset. Christianity is not even tolerated. And if one person is discovered as a Christian, the entire family can not only be sent to prison, but may even be sent to a prison camp. If a Bible or a hymnal is found in a home, an individual could either be killed immediately or the whole family sent to a prison camp for life just because they love the Lord Jesus. And um, I, I, I pray for the, you know, for the persecuted, especially in places like North Korea where this happens. Now, in prison camps, people are not fed very well. Many have starved to death. And on top of being um, uh, working and working um, without any type of mercy and not being fed well, that is a form of torture in the most brutal way. And because persecution is so intense and violent there, many of the people in North Korea don't even tell their children. Because if it slips out of a child's mouth, in school or in a community that the parents are Christians, again, they could take the whole family. So lots of times parents will wait till the child is older and knows how to keep it to himself and not be so quick to spread that information. But right now it's an estimation of about 50,000 to 700,000 Christians in these camps of North Korea. North Korean Christians need our prayers. 
And sometimes what they would do, they'll put scriptures in balloons and put them in the water, and sometimes people will find the scriptures that way because they have to be that secretive. Now, fortunately, like I said, organizations like Open Doors um, uh, provide secret workers who keep the North Korean Christians alive with food through secret networks in China and Bibles, shelter, and discipleship training for North Korean refugees at safe houses are also provided. Now, for decades, the Iranian regime hunted down Christians and placed them in Evan prison. Now, if you ever heard about Evan prison, it's one of the worst prisons where people are tortured and murdered there if they ever get out. And people who get out of that prison is really a miracle. Iran's pr um, prison system has poor living condition, the torture of prisoners, uh, of the prisoners. Wars are overcrowded, and the prisoners lack the basic necessities. Iran criminalizes evangelism and house church worship, causing pastors and lay leaders to be sent to prison. Now, despite the horrible conditions in Iran, the church is growing, which is miraculous that the church still grows. Iranian Christians have persevered and are witnesses to the world and a testimony of church growth even when God's church experiences persecution. So no matter how much persecution occurs, the church grows because they are probably praying and upholding each other and they're being encouraged in the Lord. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Nigeria. On average, one Christian is killed, they said that a few years ago was every two hours, but I believe it's probably increased since then because there are a lot of Muslims in northern Nigeria. And they will, they, they kill uh, masses of, of Christians and think nothing of it. But these attacks against the followers of Jesus in, North Korea, in, in Nigeria is growing. And in Nigeria, the level of trauma among Christians is reaching a crisis level as men and women are killed, women are raped and abducted, Christians are beheaded. In other words, they chop their heads off or they're burned alive. So they're killed in the most gruesome ways. But, and unfortunately, the Biden administration removed Nigeria as a country of concern. He should have kept them on that list. The U.S. State Department should have never cut off Nigeria from the list of one of the worst uh, persecution, per persecutors of religious freedom. Now, the American Center for Law of Justice had pressured our government to place Nigeria back on that list. Pakistan is another country where innocent Christians could easily be placed on death row and lies about the Christians um, saying that they blasphemed uh, Muhammad or the Quran could put them in prison on death row and, men, and, and in most cases, Christians don't even have a defense against them. The only thing is they can trust in the Lord and pray because there have been cases where Christians have been released from the prison in Pakistan. The legal system is totally unjust when Christians, how they are persecuted is execution by hanging. Fortunately, with the diligent efforts of the American Center for Law and Justice, there are several people that have been, uh, that, pr that we've prayed, Christians have prayed around the world, and they have been released. And there are many other examples, but what I want to do, I want to wrap up this presentation a little bit and think about how, what we can do, how we can pray for the persecuted church and lift them up. Pray that God will open up ways in which the Bibles or the Gospels can get in the hands of those who really long to have the Word of God. Pray for those who smuggle the Bibles into the land where it's illegal to have Bibles. But it's amazing how God has protected smugglers who, who, who went into lands and countries where the Word wasn't accepted, the Bible wasn't accepted, but the Word of God got into these countries anyway. Now pray that God will continue to bless evangelists, <coughs> pastors, and believers with the financial means to travel about with the gospel with one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Money's often needed for motorcycle for Vietnamese and Chinese pastors who share the gospel in forbidden areas. And lots of times they don't have cars, so they have to get around with bicycles. They're very much needed. And when they, have, when they go around in these bicycles, they're doing it at a great risk. 
So being Christians, I guess you can see, they're often discriminated against and earn barely enough money to survive. So they need the tools to get the word out. We can also continue to lift up families of Christian martyrs. And when a member of the underground church is arrested, it's illegal for anybody to help them. But lots of times we'll find that organizations and people, individual people will help them anyway. And though martyrs go to their grave to receive their reward in heaven, their families live in tragically horrible conditions, and especially mothers who have to raise children by themselves. And, um, and lots of times they, they get jobs so that they can support their families. But we can, all, we can keep in prayer organizations that reach out, and sometimes churches in America will reach out to help out. Open Doors, International Christian Concern, and Voice of the Martyrs. Um, think about how this message can help us today. One thing about this message about remembering the persecuted church is how it can help us. A reminder that God has blessed us to be able to get Bibles, at least relatively uh, inexpensively and, and freely, without having to worry about someone coming to take, you know, take it away from us or put, put us in prison for it. Lots of times I'll go to estate sales and sometimes I can get Bibles and you know, buy for a dollar, nice condition Bibles that I would uh, purchase and give them to people who, who, who need it here in America. But it's a great reminder, a message like this, is to know the power of forgiving others. No matter what a person may do to cause injury, grief, or affliction, that we forgive just as God has forgiven us. It's also a message to pray for our enemies, those who hurt us. Keep them in prayer no matter what they do, because lots of times the enemies who are persecuted of Christians, many times they do receive Jesus and give their lives to the Lord. And it's, again, a message of forgiving others, a message of being grateful for what God has done. And um, it's also a reminder of how uh, Christians in the United States should be firm in our faith and hold fast in our faith that God will help us just like he's helped those Christians in dire conditions like that. Um, we just praise God because, again, we, can, we need to continue to uphold our own government sometimes, even if a, a person's a pro-life demonstrator's. Uh, sometimes the FBI would raid the homes. All they're trying to do is save the lives of babies. And we find that these raids, that they're, they're really getting out of hand. Instead of focusing on the drug fentanyl coming into our borders because our borders have been open. That's a form of persecution in America. We can keep America in prayer too. Amen. And, um, Amen. you know, that's a powerful thing. Now what I'm going to do... Again, I'm going to give you a chance to look at this map, and you're welcome to look through it while, um, you know, before you go home today. But what I have here is a nice folder, and a folder for every one per family. All this material is free. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay a dime for it. But in it, we have a sample of the Voice of the Martyrs and a prayer guide. It gives information about different countries throughout the world and what their needs are and, and, and the level of persecution there. And then you also have in this folder a global prayer movement, and you got a, a free DVD in it to, to watch, and, um, and a bookmark that you can have so that when you are reading your own Bible, you'll have a bookmark and you'll have specific prayers to pray. And in this packet here is um, a, a postcard where you get a free subscription the Voice of the Martyrs. You don't have to pay a dime for it unless you want to give them a donation once in a while. And then there is, in this packet, is called The Last Words of the Martyrs. And some of the testimonies of some of the things that they've gone through, God has just been gracious. But one thing, thank God for those who made it to their heavenly home. And they're going to be just have, have enjoy the Lord. No more persecution, but they'll be with Jesus. So this little book is very easy reading. You might want to have a box of tissue if you're kind of prone to get emotional <coughs> while you're reading it. Um, and what you'll also get today, like I say, each person will get this book, and it's by Richard Warmbrand. You'll get a, a lot more examples of 
you know, the type of persecution he went through, how we can pray for the persecuted church, and um, just, um, you know, ju just things that you may not be aware of. So I would suggest that each family get this, and don't read it all in one city. It can be overwhelming to you. But uh, this is for my gift to you today. And again, I want to thank um, uh, Pastor for allowing me to come before you again. So that's it. God bless you, and we may heaven smile upon you. So. Also, these postcards are available. I, do, I, don't, uh, I don't know if I have one for everyone, but if you just put your name and address, you'll also get another free book. It's called Hearts of Fire, and it comes from the Voice of the Martyrs. It's absolutely free. All you got to do is put it in the mailbox, and it'll come to your home, and it gives you more examples of the um, Christians and their persecution. God bless you. God bless you.